Good morning, church. Let's stay and worship together. Welcome to Discover Church. It's so great to see you all here. I got a live audience. To all of you joining us online, a very special welcome to you as well. Thanks for being with us. When you came in the back table, there was uh, the notes and the program, things that, things that are happening around here. Just wanted to point out a few. Um, so first and foremost, next week, we're starting up the next phase of the reopening. So we'll have the children's ministries will start to reopen. So we'll have that reopened. And so if you've been waiting to come back because you needed to put your kids someplace, next week is the week, and we want to welcome the kids back. 
in their ministry as well. So first and foremost. Also, some things that are happening. Uh, outdoor movie night, July 18th at 8.30 here. Um, I don't see where it says trolls. We're working on it. Okay. We're, taking a, we're taking a survey. If you saw the midweek update from last week, you'll get that. If not, go back and look at it. It's kind of funny. Uh, ladies Bible study every Monday at, at 1 o'clock. Uh, the Secret Sister. Ice Cream Social. Say that fast, you know, three times. July 26th, so that's on there as well. And then, of course, because of the sickness, we're not going to be able to have touch a truck. So what we decided to do was combine that with kind of the trick-or-treat stuff. So we got truck or treat coming up in October, but you can see that on there as well. And, of course, um, the food pantry. You guys are doing a wonderful job, tremendous job in the food pantry. And so we have some needs. We need tuna, cans of fruit, peanut butter and jelly, and the next... Um, time that'll be open will be July 9th. So um, also offering, I always forget the offering. I can't forget the offering. So the offering, uh, we're not passing baskets. So there's a box back here. If you're live, if you're watching online, you can go ahead and give online. Uh, continue to be generous. We appreciate your generosity in allowing us to do the work that God has for us to do here at Discover Church. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives and what you're doing in our church and help us to spread that to the community to be salt and light so that they would know about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ so their lives could be radically changed as well. So be with us this morning as we worship you, receive that and we pray Lord that your word goes forth that it will change our hearts and change our minds. It's in Jesus name we pray, amen. So with that why don't you go ahead and stand back up and continue to worship.
be seated. Thank you so much. Great worship set. Get us in the, in the right mindset, the right frame of mind to talk about Jesus this morning. Wouldn't that be cool? So today we're going to start, we're starting a new series called On the Mount, and we're going to be taking a look at the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Now we already took a look at the first part of this, the first 12 verses in, in Matthew chapter 5 are called the Beatitudes, and we already took a look at that. We took a look at that in March and April, you may remember, and we talked about what is your Beatitude. So if you want to kind of get a refresher on that, you can go back and take a look at that and, and pick up from there. But this morning, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, and we're going to talk about <clears throat> pass the salt and turn on the lights. And as we look at this part of the Sermon on the Mount, we see that it's kind of about leadership because it's about influence. And we know that leadership is influence. And we all lead people because we influence people. 
Might be one, might be two, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand. I don't know. But we all lead someone because we all influence someone. And an interesting thing about influence, right, is you can be a positive influence or you can be a negative influence. Maybe your childhood or growing, maybe you were like me growing up, those times when I got in trouble or maybe did the things I shouldn't be doing, it was because my friends were a negative influence on me. It's all my friends, never me. Well, it might have been me once or twice, right? But there was a negative influence. So when we influence, we can be a positive influence or we can be a negative influence. The other thing about influence, influence can be intentional or it can be accidental. Right? We all want to be positive influences. We don't want to be negative influences. But we have to be intentional about it because sometimes by accident, something that we... <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> I've been informed I need to do that. I was actually going to call someone out here and cough into their arm because that's what they told me I should do. I'm thinking, why would I cough in your arm? Got my own arm. Sorry about that. Um, what was I even talking about? Accidental, right? So you could be an accidentally, you can accidentally by the things you do, the same things you say, the places you go, what you post on social media, by accident you could be a negative influence. And we don't want that in our life. So we have to be intentional with what we do, where we go, what we say, and be intentional with our leadership, be intentional with our influence. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, the Sermon on the Mount. And this is what Jesus said. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So Jesus continues with the sermon with a story that people could relate to. They understood the, the positive influence of salt and light in their life. They understood that. And they understood that it would be ludicrous to have salt that isn't salty, that's worthless in your house, or, or to take a lamp and cover it up with a basket. basket that, you don't do that. Even today, we understand the value of salt. Salt for our food around these parts, right? Salt to melt ice in the wintertime. Back in ancient times, there were some places where salt was so valuable, it was as valuable as having gold because they needed that salt. And we understand the value of light. They understood the value of light. See, they didn't have electricity back then. Ben Franklin hadn't been born to start his chain of five and ten stores. Or to, invent electric, or to invent electricity, and Edison wasn't around to harness the power of it yet. And yeah, I know my history. I did say Ben Franklin invented electricity. I know that's not the case. I know what happened. He was telling bad dad jokes, and his wife told him, why don't you go fly a kite? And he did, and let, you know, lightning hit it. So it's all in the history books. Just read the history books. Anyway, Jesus. Jesus compares our influence to salt and light, and we need to be good stewards of that so that we can help to build the kingdom of God here on earth. So let's talk about the salt of the earth. Back to verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. See, when Jesus says lost its flavor, what does that mean? That word that he used for lost its flavor is used four times in the New Testament. It's used here. It's used one time in Luke, which is also referring to salt, just like this. And then it's also used in Romans 121 and 1 Corinthians 1, uh, yeah, 120. Now, in that case, that word means foolish or, or to make to become foolish. So what Jesus is saying here is if Christians, as a Christian, one loses their saltiness, loses their flavor, they are, in fact making fools of themselves. And by doing that, become a bad representation for the kingdom of God instead of being a positive influence for the kingdom of God. 
And it doesn't make sense to have salt that's not salty around. I mean, we kind of hear that and think, how, do you, how does salt not become salty? In the time of Jesus, where they would go get their salt, they'd get it from marshes, lagoons, off by, up by the Dead Sea. They would get this salt, and the salt had a lot of impurities in it. And because of those impurities, the, the salt would spoil. And when it spoiled, there was nothing to do with it. And does that happen to us sometimes? You know, we're called as Christians, as followers of Christ, we're called to be pure salt. But every now and then, we let an impurity get into our life. And if we don't take care of that impurity and get that impurity out, you know, that area of our life can become worthless. And, and we need to watch for these impurities in our life because we don't want to become worthless because Jesus says it gets thrown out. And when Jesus says it gets thrown out, it's not like I'm just going to take the garbage out. It means to thrust out violently. It's not just I open the door and just kind of, you know, toss the salt out the front door. No, it is thrown out with violence. I got to get this out of here. And then he talks about being trampled underfoot means to be rejected with disdain. So when salt becomes worthless, you violently throw it out of the house and then you trample on it and reject it with contempt. So if we're to be salt and we're not being salty, do we run the risk of being like no good Christians? I don't know, something to think about, just something to think about. I'm not saying that's the case, just think about it. So what does salt do? Let's talk about what salt does. First thing salt does is salt gives taste. Salt gives taste. Think of the things that you eat and some of the things you eat, how bland they are until you add salt to it, like French fries. How can you eat French fries without salt in them? I mean, you might put, you know, the malt vinegar on it. And I don't know why you would want to ruin perfectly good French fries by doing that. But, hey, if that's your thing, you do it. But I don't know of anybody that eats French fries without salt because it adds flavor. Or corn on the cob. You want to get some corn on the cob, so you go to Zalay's down in the valley. You get some corn. You take it home. You cook it up. And you start to eat it. And it's okay. It's good. They have good corn. But once you put butter and add the salt, it's like, whoa. All of a sudden, it's better than okay. It's like heavenly, right? It's really good. Got to have the salt. But here's something, too, about salt. No one just eats salt by itself. What do you want for lunch? I think I'll have a plate of salt. No, nobody does that. It doesn't good. But all of a sudden, when you apply it to food, it like it unleashes this flavor in that food, and it enhances the flavor of whatever you're eating. Jesus tells us to be salt. And as followers of Christ, we're kind of that seasoning to the world. Just as salt adds flavor to food, makes things better, we're to do that for the world. We're, we're to add that same kind of flavor and spice to a really spiritually bland world. That's our role. What the world has to offer, eventually people figure out that it's not all that good. Until you add the salt and the flavor of Christ Jesus into it. And it gives us an opportunity. And the funny thing about salt, it's not easily seen, is it? Sometimes you're at a restaurant or even at the house and you get the salt shaker and you're, you don't think anything's going to, you know, you do it in your hand, right? Because it doesn't look like anything's coming out. But it is coming out. It's being effective. And that tells us that, you know, we don't have to be, make a big show out of being a follower of Christ. All we got to really do is just be natural. Live your life. Live your life with the flavor and the spice of Christ Jesus so that the world can see that. We just need to be authentic, be the salt of the earth. Now, we've all seen Christians that have been overwhelming, right? Because too much salt, you know, not enough salt, too much salt. If you put too much salt on food, it kind of ruins the flavor, right? Man, that's salty. You have this great steak and you put too much salt on it and all you taste is the salt instead of this great steak. And we know Christians that are the same way. Too much salt, they're overwhelming, kind of obnoxious. And they come across that way because they're being too consulting and they get rejected because people want to spit them out of their mouth. They get rejected because of their extreme saltiness. So when we think about the salt in our life and how our salt gives taste to the world, we have to understand that there's a balance in there, right? We, we can't remain silent and disengaged from the world 
because now there's no salt. At the same time, we can't oversalt and become obnoxious because either way, the world's not going to receive the salt that Christ Jesus wants us to be. So taste. Second thing about salt is that salt is a preservative. Salt's a preservative. When Jesus would teach, oftentimes he would talk about two different cooking things that are used in cooking. He would talk about yeast and he would talk about salt. Now, yeast is a fungus. Did you know that? Yeah, yeast is a fungus. I'm thinking, oh, I never really knew that was a fungus. But when you use yeast in cooking, right, it expands things or it ferments things. And if you partake in the things that are fermented, you become a fungi. Yeah, see, now, that you laugh at. That is terrible. You laughed at. Now I know what kind of crowd you are. Gotcha. All right. We're talking about yeast and fermentation. Okay, so yeast, when Jesus refers to yeast, oftentimes when yeast is referred to in the Bible, it's, it symbolizes evilness, right? You want to get the yeast out, this fungus out of your life. But salt is referred to as a preservative that's going to hold decay back. In Jesus' time, and not so long ago in the United States of America, uh, in the modern world, there was no refrigerators. Matter of fact, does anybody know the term icebox? You ever hear of a icebox? Your grandparents probably referred to the refrigerator as the icebox. For those of you younger never heard this phrase, an icebox was a non-mechanical refrigerator, best way to put it, and they get a block of ice, they put it in the top, and it would circulate the cold air down into the bottom and keep things cool and refrigerated. But even before that, before that was even around, the way they preserved food was with salt, especially meat, and keep it from spoiling, help it to last longer. So part of our role, right, if we are to be salt, is we are to be salt to our culture to preserve it, to keep it from rotting from the evil that wants to decay it and, and make it, make it uh, you know, like a fungus. We're to stand up for righteous things. That's part of our role, to stand up for righteous things, to be a voice in the world that so often seems to be anti-God and anti-Christian and their thoughts and their practices and the things they say. And we're to stand up for righteousness. We're the ones that are supposed to stand up and, and talk about such things as traditional biblical values when it comes to family. We are the ones that should be leading the charge when it's justice for all and even for the unborn child. But here's the key. We have to do that in a loving way. It's salt. It's preserving, right? But it has to be done in a loving way. We need to be the preservative in our workplaces to stand against sin and stand against evil and the things that are happening there not, and not to enter into conversations we shouldn't be involved in and be careful in the words that we choose. And to stand up and not be like everybody else and not lie and cheat and steal from your company. Also that we can preserve and remind people of what the right thing is to do. And, and being a preservative from those that want to spread evil. It's almost like, it's almost like we're kind of called to be the conscience of our community. Followers of Christ are supposed to do that. Speaking out for righteousness and truth. And you might be amazed. You might actually be amazed when you stand up and say something, how many other people are going to stand beside you and behind you and voice the same thing? I remember this time, oh, man, this was years ago. So my family, we're Cleveland Indians fans, so at least I got that going for me, right? Okay, at least I got that going for me. So we're big Cleveland Indians fans, and if you recall back in the 90s, you could not get a ticket to go to Jacobs Field. I mean, they would sell out every game. We were living, still living in Columbus. Now, in Columbus, Columbus is partly Cincinnati Red and partly Cleveland Indians, actually you know, more Reds than Indians, probably more Indians than Reds now, but back in that time was more Reds than Indians. And so that was the year that the Cleveland Indians were playing Cincinnati Reds in Cincinnati. So I said to Jan, hey, why don't we just go down in there, spend a weekend, us and our two kids. And so we decided to do that and had some fun, went to some parks and go to the game at night. So we're at the game, and, and Cincinnati's not doing well because Cincinnati was not a good baseball team at that time. And so, and they're, you know, we're out in left field, and we're in the middle of the row. About three or four rows in front of us are a couple of young men that came in. Now, <clears throat> they came in half drunk. And they decided that during the game they were going to get all the way drunk, which they did. 
And as the game progressed, you know, there's words, and it's like, yeah, you know, I got my six-year-old daughter, my nine-year-old son here. That, you can't have much of that. Well, Cincinnati has one out, bases loaded. They're trying to rally, trying to come back, and one of their players hits into a double play, and this one guy unleashes. I mean, it would have embarrassed a Navy sailor. I'm thinking, whoa. And finally, I said, I had had enough. I'm, you know, I, I say, hey, 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 you need to watch it. You know, we got little kids around here. You need to watch your language. You know, calm it down. So he's mad, and his buddy, you know, they sit down. Then he stands up and reminds me that kids have to go to school, and they shouldn't be out that late. I'm thinking it's June. There is no school. It's Friday night, and they're my freaking kids. I'll do with my kids what I want to do. And so I told the other guy that he needed to calm his buddy down. Now, as this is transpiring, two or three people turn around and they mouth to me, thank you. I'm thinking, well, why didn't you say something? I'm the one that has to worry whether I'm going to get to my car okay now, right? But we did and we made it. But you'd be surprised. <clears throat> you'd be surprised how many people will stand beside you and will stand behind you when you speak up for righteousness and truth. So are you being an influence that prevents decay in others? The third thing salt does is salt creates thirst. That's true. Ah. It's said you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can salt the oats to make him thirsty, right? You go to restaurants and bars all over this country. In restaurants and bars, they give you free food. You know what they give you? Salted nuts, salted popcorn, and salted pretzels. Why do they do that? Why? To make you thirsty. So you drink more. Now, I'm told, I don't know if it's true, but you go to buffets, at buffets, they oversalt their food. And the reason they do that is that you'll fill up on pop and, and water instead of eating more food. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'm told that's true. But it's salt because salt makes you thirsty. When you're at work, you're in your community, you got your kids' activities. We have an opportunity to mix with people that don't know Christ Jesus. And it's during those opportunities that perhaps we can help people become thirsty for finding out more about who Jesus is. That's why we use verses around here like Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone treating everyone with gentleness and respect, and all of a sudden, they'll start to want to listen to you. People will, will seek you out because of the thirst in their life. And they're thirsty in their life, and if all they see are other thirsty people, they don't want to know what to do. But if they see you as a follower of Christ speaking for righteousness and truth, when they become thirsty, when they see the gentleness and respect, season, truth seasoned with salt, they're going to talk to you. And it'll give you an opportunity to influence and invite. That's what we're called to do. In your notes, here's another. As Christians, we need to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. Out of the salt shaker and into the world. See, salt is a seasoning. It's a preservative. It creates this thirst. But remember, remember this. Salt must be brought into contact with that thing it's trying to season. You can have the salt on your table, and if you never put it on your food, your food will never in, be enhanced by that flavor. You have to get it out of the salt shaker, and it's just like us. As a matter of fact, I believe this isn't an option for us as followers of Christ. It's a command. Jesus says, do this. Get out of your comfort zone. Go hang out with some non-followers of Christ. Go hang out with some sinners to be salt in their life. So how is your saltiness? Are you being salty? Because remember this, remember this. Salt is a hidden but powerful influence. Salt is a hidden but powerful influence, while light is a visible and revealing influence. So let's go talk about the light of the world. We're supposed to be salt and light. So light of the world. When we see light in the Bible, light in the Bible represents Things that are, that are, it represents truth, represents grace, represents the awesome works of God. And when we see darkness talked about, it represents sin, 
evil, and the detestable works of Satan. So light and darkness. In John 8, 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. See, Jesus tells us we are to be light, and light brings life. And just as Jesus is the light of the world, we are to be a reflection of that light to the world. So back to Matthew chapter 5, let's read 14 and 15 again. Jesus says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So here Jesus talks about two different kinds of light. So one is, in verse 14, the city on a hill. Now remember, if you, if you kind of can think about the times when Jesus lived, a lot of those cities that were built on a hill, it's not like a hill around here where there's pine trees and trees and grass. There it was rocky, sometimes white limestone, and they would build these cities on top of the hill, sometimes for protection. But because there was nothing around up on this hill, up on this rocky hill, at night when those cities would light up, everybody could see those lights for miles and miles and miles around. And one of the things that did was for travelers was help to set direction. Oh, yeah, I'm, I was headed this way. There's the light. I'm supposed to be going that way. So it sets a direction. And then in verse 15, Jesus talks about the lamp. And he take and put the basket over the lamp. And he says, that's not very smart. Why would you do that? I mean, you light a lamp to light up a room. You don't light it, you know. And besides, that would be a waste of oil. And oil is expensive. You're not supposed to do that. He talked about how ludicrous that would be. And since we are the light of the world, it would be just as wasteful as a follower of Christ to live a Christian lifestyle, but cover it up with a basket of some sort, to hide that from others. I mean, Jesus didn't tell us to be the light of the church. He didn't say, let's go talk about me, talk about me on Sundays when you're at church, that's okay, but when you leave the doors of the church, you don't, not anymore. Actually, what he said is you need to be the light of the world. And the most important thing is not what we talk about here, although that's important. The most important is how we live our life when we go outside those doors to be light to the world. So what does, what does light do? How do we do that? First of all, light dispels darkness. It makes darkness go away. Whenever you introduce light into darkness... Even if it's just a little bit of light in a totally dark room, it illuminates that darkness. It dispels it. In John chapter 1, verse 4, uh, it says, In him, referring to Jesus, in him was life, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. But darkness was not under, has, but dark, you know, I can read. But the darkness has not understood it. See, Jesus came to get rid of darkness. He is the light in the darkness. And, and a lot of people reject that. And they, they either misunderstand that. They don't like this brightness of when Jesus invades their life, when dispels the darkness. They don't like it. They don't understand it. And so they reject him. They don't reject you. They don't reject me. Even though we feel that way sometimes, they're rejecting Jesus because they don't understand. Or, or that brightness is revealing something that they don't want to have revealed. And I know how that is. Over the years, I will, you know, I'd be reading the Bible, I'll read a verse, or I'm at a Bible study, or, uh, you know, I hear a sermon either live or one that's recorded, and it kind of touches an area of my life, and all of a sudden this brightness comes into my life, and that's an area of my life that's still kind of dark. And all of a sudden, the Word of God and Jesus comes in, it's bright and it's painful, and it's like, no, you know what? It's not that bad, Jesus. Just leave that area alone. Just leave it. I kind of like doing that anyway. But all of a sudden, that painful, bright light comes in. You go, oh, man, I'm going to have to address that now because it dispels the darkness. And when it does that in our life individually, we have a choice to make. Do I turn that area of my life over to Jesus or do I continue to walk around in darkness in that area of my life? And it's pretty simple, but that's what he does. And it is possible that the light that you reflect, the light of your life makes people uncomfortable that's okay. That's okay if you're reflecting the light of Jesus. If that's what's making him uncomfortable, that's okay. It's not you making him uncomfortable. It's that bright 
brilliant light that Jesus is bringing into our life that's making them uncomfortable. I mean, why do you think? Why, seriously, why, why do you think that, that people attack Christians and Christianity the way they do? So often it's because this brightness of what comes in is like, wow, that's painful. I don't, want, I don't want to stop doing that. But light comes into the darkness and it dispels the darkness and all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, I have to deal with this now. Second thing that light does is the light gives, it gives guidance. Gives guidance. Years ago, um, I, part of my job re, um, involved working in coal mines. So I would go down into coal mines. Yeah. I don't know how much those guys get paid. <laughs> they burn every nickel of it as far as I'm concerned. But you get on this elevator, right? They, you know, have your helmet. You got your lamp on your helmet. You get in an elevator. You go, you know, a mile or however far down in this elevator underground. You step off, step into the tunnel. The only light that you had oftentimes was the lamp on your helmet. Now, just for fun, they would have everybody turn those off. And, I, you know, I didn't realize they were hazing me as a rookie, but that's what they did. They hazed the rooks. Turn the light off. I mean, it was nothing. You could not, I mean, it was pitch dark. I mean, it was creepy. You didn't, I mean, you didn't know if I go right, if I go left, I'm going to run into a wall, I'm going to fall into something. I mean, and then you turn the light back on, just that little bit of light. But it was complete darkness. And Psalm 119, 105 says this. It says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. And for us to safely navigate in the coal mines, we had to have that lamp on to, to know what path to take. And when we live out our faith in our ordinary daily lives, doing the things that we do with our families and with our friends and with our coworkers and with our neighbors, it's an opportunity, the way we live, the words we speak, the places that we go, it to be that light, to light up a pathway that could lead people to the Heavenly Father. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did that, the way that he lived, the way that he talked, the way that he acted, the places that he went to. It was all for a path out of darkness to light up a pathway to the heavenly Father. And we're to follow his example. And, and whether we like, like it or not, uh, we're on display. We're on display. Me probably more than you. Um, but we were, we were down, we went to an ice cream shop down where we live, and some guy came up. We were with a friends of ours, a couple that went to church together with us at Sycamore Creek. And this guy comes up and he says, Sycamore Creek, you guys Sycamore Creek. I, and we said, yeah, we go to Sycamore Creek. And he says, I, I go there. I've heard you preach twice. And I said, you're still coming back. It's amazing. And, but we're on display whether we like it or not. The things we say, the things we do, the things we post on social media. Think about those things. Are those things that are providing a guide, a pathway to Jesus, or are they not? So, because light is supposed to give guidance. Third thing that light does, it reveals what is there. It reveals what is there. Sometimes you come home, you know, and it's dark, and you go start to go into a room, and you see some movement in that room. And now you're freaking out, right? You see this movement, think there's somebody in here, you know, you can reach for your or whatever, right, and you flip the light on, and there's nobody there. There's a curtain, you know, the window's open and the curtain, right? But, you know, in my house, I'm always afraid someone's going to jump out and scare me. I know, isn't that a terrible way to live, thinking that somebody's going to jump from behind an appliance and scare you? But anyway, so light, but you turn on the light, and you see everything that's there, and, you know, you had some fear, but that fear goes away because light reveals what is there. You know what's really cool? Have you seen these crime shows? Right, they're doing a crime investigation, and they come in with that special black light, and they turn that thing on, and then the whole, you know, the whole crime scene lights up with all whatever. It's like, oh man, that changes everything that's gone on, right? And you can see what's there. So my question is, what would a spiritual black light reveal that might be missed under normal lighting? Because Jesus goes on in Matthew five sixteen, he says this: in the same way, same way, let your good Deeds shine out for all to see, or let your light shine for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. To, to let our light shine, that means to, to beam or radiate in brilliance. People shouldn't need a black light to see what your Christian life is like. 
Because we're supposed to shine with brilliance, to let it shine. Let your light shine about Jesus so that they come to God. Psalm 34, 5 says this, those who look to him are radiant, are radiant. As you turn your attention to Jesus Christ and you spend time with them, it's going to radiate from your face. You think, God, I don't, I don't think that's true, Mark. It's true. It's true. How many of you have walked into a room? You're at a, I don't know, business conference, a big conference, two, three, four, five hundred 500 people there. You look around the room, and almost immediately you can find out who your Christian brother and sister is. Right? Because they radiate. Their, you can see the difference in them. I go to, well, I went to my high school reunion. Well, I haven't, I, well, I've gone to a couple of them, but I went to one as more of a hangout. I could tell. I could tell which ones were my Christian brothers and sisters. I could just tell that radiated from them of who they were and what they stood for. And here's the thing. The world will see that. We have the opportunity to be an influence. And when we, when we share our faith openly with the world because the world is watching and we need to shine forth and let them see what's going on in our life, that there's a God that loves them, a God that cares about them, and that there's more for them in this life than, than what they think the world has to offer because there's Jesus that has more to give to them. So what can we do? What can we do? What are some of the practical things to be salt and light in the world? So here's a saying. Here's a saying for us all to remember as we think about practical things we can do. Don't be a Christian who repels people from Christ. Instead, become a contagious Christian. Because we've seen those Christians that repel people away from Christ, right? We've seen them and what they're like. There's the in-your-face Christian who yell and shout at you. They stand on the street corner and they yell, you know, you need to get right or you're going to get left. You better turn or you're going to burn, right? We've seen them. They seem to be more interested in scaring the hell out of you instead of rescuing you from hell, right? We've seen those people. There's also the holier-than-thou Christian. The holier-than-thou Christian that, 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 that their way is the right way. And it's the only way. And if you do it any other way than their way, it's the wrong way. And they're judgmental and they're legalistic and they're smug. And they make up these rules and standards for living their life that oftentimes aren't even biblical. And there's the type of Christian that repels people from, from Christ is the cosmetic Christian. Cosmetic Christian <clears throat> says all the th things, you know, right things, does all the right things, but there's no spiritual depth. There's no change in their life. There's no difference in them than anybody else in the world, but they say all the right things. But, you know, they can't be trusted. They can't be counted on. They gossip and they lie and they cheat and they steal. But they say all the right things. It's a cosmetic Christian. Instead... Instead, we're, we're to become a contagious Christian. We do that by, by living a life of sacrifice, sacrificing our time and our talent and our treasure and our opportunities to be a servant to all people. We do that by actively showing compassion. Who is somebody this week that you can show compassion to, to give them compassion that they need? It's by being authentic and real, not perfect, not perfect. Because, you know, we, none of us are. I mean, no matter what your grandma said about you, <laughs> you're not perfect. Sorry to break that news to you. But we can be authentic and we can be real. It's forgiving those that need to be forgiven, that have wronged us, even if they don't deserve it. Standing up for justice for the, for the person that is, that is being unjustly criticized or unjustly persecuted and it's standing up for the poor when there's no one there to stand up for them. It's, it's standing up for sexual purity. It's spending time with God in a quiet time with or in front of your family. It'd be really cool for your kids to come over sometime and catch you reading the Bible or praying. Not as a show because that's who you are to show them that's who we are to catch you praying and reading the Bible. Showing mercy to people that need it, refusing to engage in gossip personally or on social media, but to speak the truth and love directly to the individual that needs to be talked to. And Jesus calls us, he calls us to be salt and life in a world 
because we can point people to the Heavenly Father through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. So that's why he's saying, be salt and light. So this week, this week, how can you grow? How can you grow to be salt and life by becoming a contagious Christian so that others will want to have what you have so that they can get in their life, they can get salt and light in their lives as well? Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. We thank you for your word that points out how to live our life, and we thank you for Jesus who came, lived on this earth, who died was buried and rose again and ascended to be with you. Help us to follow your teaching, to become salt, to add your flavor to the world, to preserve it with righteous, talking about righteous things, to, to create thirst for others to follow Jesus. And help us shine our light into the darkness and guide us along the right paths and reveal to us where we need to have your truth. So Father, this week, Help us to spend some time to figure out how we can become the contagious Christian you want us to be, to be salt and light in a world that is oftentimes hurting and in great pain and doesn't know what to do and doesn't have the answers and is searching for answers. And they need to run into us so we can point them to your son, Jesus. Help us do that. And I pray for those that here this morning that, Maybe this bright, brilliant light has shone on to their life and they know they need to change and they want to follow Jesus. If that's you, just ask right where you're at. Jesus, I want to follow you. Forgive me. Help me to follow you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple of things, just a reminder. Um, well, if that was you, if you prayed that prayer and you want to find out and get more information on what it means to follow Jesus, come talk to me or talk to, if you're here, whoever brought you and seek out that information. We want to help you in that process. If you're doing that online, shoot me an email, mark at discoverchurch.life, and, and I'll get back to you and make sure we get you some material. Um, also, next week, I'm excited, next week, phase two, children's ministry starts back up. So once again, if you're watching online and you didn't hear that earlier, next week we're starting children's ministry. So if you've been waiting for that to be able to come back so your kids have something to do while you're here in a church service, next week is the week, and we look forward to seeing you back here then. And next week, we're going to talk about Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. We're going to talk about fixing broken relationships. So if you have relationships that have kind of gone sideways, or if you just want to kind of learn that information to help someone else, that's what we'll be talking about next week. So. Till then, I look forward to seeing you next week. Make it a great week.